when you're racing online against all these other guys, when you're making a move and you're braking and you're accelerating and you're fighting for position, you're still using the same parts of your brain as you would do in the real life. It's the closest thing to real life motorsport as you get. Sim racing, thanks to the power of the internet, has developed rapidly over the last few years. This has opened up the expensive world of motor racing to a whole new demographic of drivers, eager and ready to compete from wherever they want. So I basically, we, we won five championships in the one year really, really well. The, my name was all about the place and, and in the next again year, it was everybody wanted me to drive for them kind of thing. But you needed over a hundred thousand pounds, you know, so it was tough. We tried our hardest to get sponsors, wrote for emails out to so numerous companies for, for two years, just couldn't get anything. And to be fair, 2008, I was 18 and that was right in the middle of the credit crunch. So that was just kind of career ending. Now that I can't do racing in real life, I've looked for the closest thing to it and so I got myself a little simulator at home. So basically I race and go to a certain track, whatever track they're about to add to the service, and they laser scan the track. So they've got loads of cameras and scanners it's all set up on the track. So and every bump, every curb, every bit of grass that's got a hump in it, it's it's, re it's a replica, you know. So it's crazy to think that you're actually not at a real racetrack when you're on there racing because it just feels so real, you know. It's um it's crazy. Oh. If you stop racing like I did and you stop going to racetracks, you're just getting forgotten about. You need to be at the circuits, you need to be, your name needs to be circulating to keep out there. So I'm Graham Carroll, 26 year old from Edinburgh in Scotland, uh, and I'm a competitor in the, the Visa Vegas e-race. At the time, nobody knew if this thing was going to happen, if it was real, million dollars, no one had ever heard anything like this. Ever since the first race, it was on there every day and you were just panicking. So I got into third place and as soon as I was there, just two boys just completely wiped me out. There's no brain cells at all, just stupidity really. And at the time, I was a bit annoyed and chuffed with it, but ah, it, was, it was hard to take at the time, you know. There's a lot of guys out there with, with some really bad talent, but with lots and lots of money, you know, and it makes it easy to go racing at these high levels. I'd love to make a career out of sim racing, at the minute, I don't really see there being that many competitions that you could go and enter and, and live off of. Now, I hope, I hope to God that, that more competitions do come out and we can, we can maybe do that. The main thing at the minute is to build the numbers and get more people on track, that's the main thing. In May this year, Formula One team McLaren Honda launched a virtual racing competition, the world's fastest gamer with the winner being offered a one-year contract to work for them and test cars on their simulator. One of my favourite quotes is Fernando Alonso when he first won the Drivers' World Championship and someone said, Fernando, what's it like to be the best driver in the world? And he said, I'm not the best racing driver in the world. There's a guy driving a bus in Mexico who's the best racing driver in the world. He just doesn't know it yet. This programme is to try and find that Mexican bus driver. What gaming does in bringing drivers through is democratise motorsport. Motorsport is exceedingly expensive even to do go-karting. So we're losing out on a huge amount of talent. The millennials and younger are finding sports through different ways and then they're consuming the sport through different ways. What it's forgotten about is the fact that one of the biggest franchises of gaming is in the motorsport world. Gran Turismo has been around 25 years. It's sold 77 million copies. We have an audience that's getting older, and we need an audience that's getting getting younger in Formula One. And I think esports will, uh, it's not the only solution, but it, it can be a big contributor to it. Formula One has always prided itself at being at the forefront of technology, but it also realizes it needs to be more entertaining. Are these two factors incompatible? Rover Race is really the Formula One of the future. You know, it's about putting drivers of the future, which are AI drivers, into the most extreme cars and putting them in extreme environments. Driverless cars are here. They are the cutting edge. So if we see them on the streets, won't we expect to see them racing too? Robo Race has the ambition to be the future of motor racing and is being developed right now. But will robotic racing really be the dawn of a sporting revolution? 
It's the cutting edge of sport. It's also the cutting edge of research and development for autonomous vehicles. This is the DevBot. This is our development vehicle. Most important thing is that you, you give the car the ability to perceive the environment. So you've got down here, you've got uh, LiDAR, so that's laser scanners. You've got sonar. We've got machine vision cameras. And then we've got radar. So they're the, they're the primary sensors that we have. So within here is where we have the, the compute. So we have a driver's seat for safety. So when we're testing and developing, we can have a driver sitting there monitoring the systems, very much like a guardian of the systems. But sitting behind the driver is all of the compute infrastructure. An AI driver is really a piece of software that represents how you and I think. So it's basically how do you perceive where you are and how do you take the appropriate actions based on the conditions that you're in. Anyone who follows motorsport knows that the performance of the car is probably the biggest differentiator. In road race that can't be the case because we're trying to showcase the quality of the software that's inside the cars. We'll set all the vehicles up to be identical. You are really only differentiating on driving performance. It has to be a sport. At the core it has to be a sport. If it becomes a procession, if it becomes 10 cars, 20 cars following each other around, very, very similar speeds, lap after lap after lap, with very limited overtaking. It will not work as a sport. That's not what Rover Race represents. Formula One is at the strategic layer. That, that's come down, that's dominating what happens at the tactical layer. So drivers don't make overtaking maneuvers because for the strategy it doesn't work. So they're told to run in certain conditions. Now, really what people like to watch is tactical decision making. You know, second by second decision making. That's what you want to see. And when it gets nullified in things like Formula One with some of the regulations, some of the rules about the driving behavior, that's what the public don't like. They don't want to see it being a pure strategic competition. Let's say you cheer at the moment for the human driver. In Robo Race, you're cheering for the AI driver, that character that exists. And then it's really about, well, what defines character? There's two ways to do it. One is to focus on the driver's performance. So you characterize the driver within a simulator environment. Um, you're then able to take those characteristics, like driving styles and decision-making characteristics, and place those as the AI driver within the car. And that's where you really start to blend the, the eSports, gaming, virtual reality with physical reality. Just in Overall society, we're on that dawn. It's really a question of whether you know, we're competing with robots or we're working with robots. Sport's just a natural reflection of that. I think we are on the verge of a robotic sports revolution. And all of these things have one thing in common, which is that they really excite audiences. Drone racing is a sport, and to us it's a sport, and to our fans it's a sport. It was a time when I think a combination of broadcasters, sponsors, pundits on the sports field felt like they could determine what a sport was. They said eSport is not a sport. It's something else. It's a game, it's something else. And audiences flocked to it. And the answer was the audience decided. You know, people voted with their eyeballs, they voted with their feet, they voted with their dollars, and, and eSports is truly a global sports movement. And so it has redefined the possibilities. While they may be small, these things are quite loud, uh, and they're very excited, and they crash often. About half the drones crash in every race, so there's a lot of crashing in this war. So it's a very fun, lively, exciting experience. And people in the audience have three choices. So they can watch the drone with their naked eye, which is very fun, because you're seeing it in real life, it's actually happening. A lot of times you can watch the television, we have the, the broadcast cut going on. But the other fun thing is that the audience can uh, put on goggles, and they can tune in, to their favorite pilot at the beginning of the race, and they can watch the race the way the pilot watches the race, from the pilot's point of view. Uh, and you often see people in our audience, goggles on, sort of looking around, reacting to things that are happening with the pilot. So you, people get to sort of immerse themselves in the sport in a way that I think is pretty unique. And that combination makes a very novel live audience experience. Drone racing is getting more and more powerful. A quick, vibrant sport, perfect for future consumption. It's also made for virtual reality. Could this be a clue as to how we are going to watch our sport from now on?
Populous, probably the world's leading designer of sports stadia and who are currently creating the new Spurs Stadium, are trying to work out what our live digital experience will be like. When you start looking at millennials and how they want to view events and sport particularly, will become an increasingly important bit of information, statistics, different camera angles, personalised camera angles. You know, we've been working with big clothing manufacturer in North America looking at what they call smart uniforms, where you know, the players are all wearing kit that measures blood pressure, heartbeat, perspiration levels, has GPS trackers, and you'll be able to see that on your screen. I think equally you will have more connectivity digitally within the stadium. I think the other piece is actually looking at remote audiences. And I think we're beginning to see this idea that you might have a remote stadium or remote stadiums around the world that are literally viewing the same game. There's been a lot of work on holographic representation, seeing a facsimile of the same game. So one could imagine you know, Real Madrid supporters in Sao Paulo watching the game in some kind of arena at the same time, sharing some kind of uh, similar live experience. I think that's where the interesting bit on AR and VR and comes into the future of sport. Stadiums have been described as the cathedrals of uh, our age. It seems the world is looking for difference. We're trying to isolate how I'm different from you. I think in a live event, whether it's a football event or a, a music event, that idea of being part of a community, belonging, sharing something is, is really special and I think when you're in there and you see something amazing, you share whatever that incredible goal was, incredible save was, um, you feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself. I think that's really important. <laughs>